quienes somos activistas del ecologismo social y centramos eh, nuestro activismo fundamentalmente en tratar de visibilizar la guerra que este modelo económico y la cultura que se desencadena alrededor de él ha declarado a la naturaleza, a las personas y, por tanto, a la vida, no nos es muy difícil encontrar un nexo, un hilo conductor entre las diferentes obras de Naomi Klein. En No Logo nos encontrábamos la denuncia y la constatación del poder de las multinacionales y todo ese dispositivo de conquista del alma que sostiene simbólicamente y materialmente los imaginarios que permiten o que permiten que exista este modelo económico. La doctrina del shock ponía de manifiesto cuáles son los mecanismos del extractivismo social, podría llamarse así, que pretende sacar cualquier gota de rentabilidad de cualquier proceso comunitario, de cualquier proceso político y que se está viviendo, se vivió primero en algunos lugares en los planes de ajuste estructural y que estamos viviendo de una forma tan absolutamente descarnada en, en, en la sociedad que tenemos ahora mismo y en concreto en el Estado español. Este último libro titulado Esto cambia todo, el capitalismo contra el clima, entra de lleno en la parte más material de este extractivismo, de esta lucha contra la vida, ¿no? y se centra en un fenómeno como es el del cambio climático, avanzando y abordando de una forma, diría yo, muy rigurosa y clarísima, lo que es la explicación del cambio climático, cómo ha sido posible construir ese discurso del negacionismo que de alguna manera contravenía todo lo que estaba planteando la ciencia en un modelo que, sin embargo, sacraliza la ciencia. Yo creo que eso queda fantásticamente expresado. Expresa también de una forma clara el conflicto que existe en las luchas y resistencias contra el problema del cambio climático, con la idea clara de que si los mercados no tienen como prioridad la vida de la gente y los políticos dejan de cuidar a las personas, parece que el cambio solamente va a venir de nosotros y nosotras mismas. Y esto lo aborda muy bien al recoger todo este conjunto de luchas eh, contra el extractivismo que llama, eh, llama bloqueidia. ¿no? Y por último, quería señalar, antes de darle ya paso, que se nota mucho que este libro está escrito por una mujer. No solamente porque recoja una buena parte de las luchas en defensa del territorio protagonizadas por mujeres, sino porque además recoge de una forma clara cómo todos los efectos de este sistema atraviesan los cuerpos de la persona, atraviesan las vidas cotidianas y, en mi opinión, muestra de una forma evidente, incluso proyectándose ella misma con su propia experiencia sobre la maternidad, que en un capítulo precioso que tiene el libro, ¿no? este, viejo, eh, este viejo principio feminista de que lo personal también es político. It's been a long time since I've been in Spain. It's actually been uh, eight years. I was here in, in 2007 to launch the shock doctrine in Spanish. And that's the last time I was here. Uh, and part of that is because I have been trying to fly less. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's also because this book has been really all encompassing. I think that a lot of you here are familiar with my last book, with the Shock Doctrine, and what that book described, which is a very ugly tactic through which our elites have systematically harnessed moments of shock, moments of intense crisis, uh, whether wars, terrorist attacks, um, economic crises, or increasingly natural disasters linked to climate change in order to push through extremely unpopular policies, essentially using shock uh, to do an end run around democracy, to say we can't afford democracy anymore because we have an emergency um, and we just have to push through all of these policies under cover of crisis. So when, um, when the book was finished, I sent the book to Alfonso Cuaron, the wonderful uh, Mexican filmmaker who had recently uh, finished a film called Children of Men. Uh, and, uh, and, and I asked Alfonso to read the book and send me a quote. And he did something much better than that, which is he made me a short film. Uh, a six-minute film, a trailer for the, for, for the shock doctrine. 
and um, it's, it's, it's a great piece. And um, we ended on a slogan. This is 2007, remember. And the, the slogan was, information is shock resistance. Arm yourselves. And the idea was that if people really understood this tactic, understood how it has been used so systematically to advance these brutal economic policies from the coup in Chile in 1973 up to September 11th. Um, if we understood this, then we could resist it. We could name it and we could use it to stay oriented during moments of intense transition and intense transformation. So less than a year after the shock doctrine was published, we unfortunately had a chance to test this theory, to test the theory that information is shock resistance. Um, because of course, a few months later, Wall Street collapsed and we found ourselves in the midst of an intense economic shock. Um, at the time that this happened, at the time that um, our governments spent trillions of dollars in order to bail out the banks that had caused the crisis, many people described this as the shock doctrine and warned that if this happened, if we responded to the crisis in this way, then it would become a pretext to impose brutal austerity, to privatize, to further privatize the public sphere, um, and to push all kinds of policies that people would otherwise resist. And indeed, by 2009, there were mass movements across Europe, including in Spain, that were resisting precisely this tactic. And the slogan, which was first uh, heard in Italy, but ricocheted around the world, um, was, we won't pay for your crisis. We will not pay for your crisis. Um, in other words, we knew it was happening. <laughs> we knew it was happening while it was happening, and we fought back. I'm sure that every person in this room participated in many demonstrations against precisely this kind of crisis exploitation. I certainly did in my country. We occupied squares. We occupied Wall Street in North America, inspired uh, in part by the Indignados movement here in Spain. We fought hard, and we fought, I think, um, with our eyes wide open, but it didn't work. The economic punishment of the many kept coming while impunity reigned for the architects of the crisis. So in the first uh, year in the midst of the economic crisis, as I toured and spoke to, to groups of people about the shock doctrine, the question that I started to hear was, um, how can we develop a strategy to respond to crisis that is a progressive response to crisis? How can we have a kind of people's shock doctrine, a response that doesn't try to overturn democracy but does the opposite, responds to crisis by deepening democracy, um, responds to crisis not by pushing through policies that increase inequality but does the opposite, responds to crisis by by, by, by building a more equal world, by advancing policies that tangibly improve people's lives, that shift values in concrete ways, can we do this? And you know, when I first launched the book, I, I, the first event I had for it was in the city of New Orleans, which was still reeling from the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And I received this question from, uh, from a labor organizer. Uh, named Saket Soni, and it really stayed in my head. He said, because in the book I use this word disaster capitalism to describe uh, um, what happens in moments of crisis. He said, okay, Naomi, they have disaster capitalism. We need disaster collectivism. How can we build that? And we know historically that moments of shock, moments of crisis have been opportunities for progressive movements. That, is certainly, that was certainly the case after the market shock 
1929, when the market collapsed. That became a moment um, when in, the, in North America, Social Security was born, huge public investment happened, uh, all kinds of public funding for the arts, housing. Uh, it was a moment of rapid transformation. And in fact, so the society was moving so far to the left that the New Deal was a compromise. It was, in fact, capitalism saving itself from revolutionary change. We also know uh, that after the Second World War, that was a moment when uh, countries like mine in Canada, the UK won universal health care um, and, and other policies that benefited huge numbers of people. So there is historical precedent for shocks, for crises, to be moments when democracies deepen, um, when progressives can win these big victories. But that didn't happen after the 2008 crisis. And what I've come to understand is that the reason for that is that while we have said very strongly what we didn't want, while we had a very loud no, we never had a convincing enough yes. We never had a convincing enough counter-narrative to the narrative of austerity. Uh, a story to really rival the narrative of scarcity that came to dominate the globe so powerfully. So even as people rejected uh, the logic of austerity, they didn't have confidence in the alternatives. So, this new book, This Changes Everything, is in a way my belated response to these questions that I received after publishing The Shock Doctrine, what could be a progressive response to crisis? Because I think part of a progressive response to crisis is redefining what a crisis is, right? Uh, the, the, the declaration of a crisis is a subjective process. Our elites decide when something is a crisis, but elites aren't the only ones who can decide something is a crisis. Right now, in the United States, um, uh, there's a movement of African Americans declaring the fact that the, po the po police shooting of unarmed black men is a crisis. They've been doing it for decades, um, but something changed, something tipped and a mass movement emerged declaring that black lives mattered and said what has become normal is no longer acceptable. And indeed, if we look at the history of social change, it is a history of crises being declared from below, uh, declaring that slavery is a moral crisis, that patriarchy is a moral crisis, and forcing changes upon our elites because of the power of mass movements. The argument I'm making in the book is that climate change can be and indeed must be such a crisis. Our elites do not behave as if it's a crisis, but it is a crisis uh, behind which there is a huge amount of scientific consensus. And we do our elites a huge favor when progressives accept the narrative that climate change is something that we can only care about when the economy is good, that it's somehow a luxury to be reserved for boom economic times and something to be forgotten during times of economic crisis. What I want to offer to you tonight is that I believe that climate change is the most powerful counter-narrative we have to the brutal logic of deregulated capitalism. Our economic model is not only waging war on workers, on communities, on public services, and social safety nets, as you well know here in Spain. It is also waging war on the life support systems of the planet itself, the conditions for life on Earth. And I think the clearest example of this conflict is the way in which the economic crisis of 2008 was used to sacrifice the planet, as well as sacrifice so many people's lives here in Southern Europe. Now, it's perfectly understandable that the movements against austerity have been focused on pensions, healthcare, education, housing, food, 
These are the daily concerns. But it is also true that the same logic of false scarcity, the same economic pressures, have been used to rationalize a wholesale attack on renewable energy, most dramatically in this country where there was a, a transition underway to renewable energy and it was abruptly severed. Um, at the same time as renewable energy subsidies have been slashed, not only here in Spain, but also in Italy, in Greece, in Portugal, this part of the world is also in the midst of a fossil fuel frenzy, of a push to drill, to frack for gas, um, to drill for oil and gas offshore. As you know, this is happening here in Spain. Thankfully, the push uh, to drill off the Canary Islands has been defeated, but the fracking wars are ongoing. In Italy, there are plans to double the amount of oil drilled offshore. Um, in Greece, there's pressure to drill for oil and gas in the Ionian and Aegean. Um, and of course, there's pressure in Portugal along the same lines. And what's important to remember is that up till 2008, Europe was the leading example, the beacon of leadership on climate change. And all of this was sacrificed under cover of crisis. So I was in um, Berlin a couple of days ago. And a journalist there told me that he didn't agree with my book. And he explained that this was because he said, I'm a moderate. And he said, I don't like radical change. And he also pointed out that radical change has a bad history in Germany. So most Germans feel the same way as him. Now, I told him that I understood. Radical change scares most people. And a lot of the time, it does turn out badly, especially in Germany. But here is the inconvenient truth or the convenient truth depending on your perspective when we're talking about climate change in 2015. We have waited so long, we have procrastinated for so long, all the while making the problem worse because emissions are up by 60% since we started negotiating to lower our emissions, that we now find ourselves in a situation where there are no non-radical options left on the table. The reason why I called the book This Changes Everything is not because I'm saying my book changes everything. I don't believe books change everything. Um, but I do believe that climate change changes everything. By which I mean <laughs> that no matter what we do, everything changes in one way or another. If we stay on the road we are on, if we leave our economy intact the way it is, that leads us to four to six degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels. Now, we have not even warmed the climate by one degree Celsius, and we are already seeing catastrophic results. Superstorms like Typhoon Haiyan, Cyclone Pam, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Katrina, the drought in uh, California right now, which, if it continues for another year, will deplete the water table for the state. Um, that's what less than one degrees looks like. When our governments met in Copenhagen in 2009, they defined anything above two degrees warming as far too dangerous. They set the target at two degrees. When they set that target, um, the African delegates, and I was at the, the convention, the African delegates marched through the halls of the convention center chanting that this was genocide because it would lead to mass death in sub-Saharan Africa. Island nations, low-lying island nations, um, also rejected the two degree temperature target saying that they needed a 1.5 in order to survive. That was the slogan, 1.5 to survive. So now the World Bank, the International Energy Agency, and Price Waterhouse Cooper, okay, so we're not talking about radical leftists here, say we're headed towards four to six degrees of warming. That changes everything about 
our physical world. You know, people ask me to describe what does four or six degrees warming look like? And I can't answer the question because the climate models break down. What the climate scientists tell us is they don't know whether anything over two degrees is compatible with what we would describe as civilization organized society. We're talking about endangering all of our coastal cities. Um, we are talking about massive crop failure. So, you know, my book is not filled with apocalyptic fear mongering. I think we actually are afraid enough. I think the problem is we don't see a way out. We don't see a way out of this existential fear. But what's important to understand is if we keep doing what we're doing, it changes everything about our physical world. These moderate options that German journalists are imagining don't actually exist, okay? It's not too late to prevent those radical physical changes to our world, but in order to do so, because we've waited so long, it requires radical changes to our economic and political system. That's the reality in which we find ourselves. Because we now have to cut emissions by so much, eight to 10% a year, starting now, um, that that challenges the fundamental logic of growth, which is at the heart of our economic system. So, in the book, uh, I argue that the reason why we have failed to rise to the challenge of climate change is not for the reasons that we hear so often. You know, we, we, we hear that it's human nature, that humans are just too selfish to deal with something that seems abstract, or that it's too difficult for our governments to agree on anything. I think none of these explanations actually bear up to real examination, because I mean, if, if, if this past economic crisis in Europe has taught us anything, it's that people are willing to sacrifice a hell of a lot um, in the face of abstract, seemingly abstract goals. Um, they might not do so happily, but they are doing it. Um, and as far as our governments coming together to agree on uh, a plan, well, in the same years that they have failed to negotiate a binding climate agreement that actually penalizes people who don't follow it, they built the World Trade Organization, an incredibly complex global system of rules and regulations with clear uh, penalties and, and, and binding targets. So it's possible to agree. The argument I make in the book is that what really explains the failure is catastrophic bad timing. <laughs> By which I mean that this crisis landed on our collective laps at the worst possible moment that it could have. And that moment was the year 1988. 1988 was the year when our governments first met to start negotiating emission reductions. And it was also the year before the Berlin Wall collapsed. It was, in retrospect, the triumphant moment for the neoliberal project. So when you look at what that project is, I mean, we're all familiar with it. It's privatization, it's deregulation, it's essentially a war on the public sphere. It now goes under the banner of austerity. All of it locked in under free trade deals. So what I do in the first part of the book is show the direct clash between the uh, dictates of neoliberalism, these core rules, and the most basic things that we need to do in the face of the climate crisis. If you're going to take climate change seriously, you obviously need to invest massively in the public sphere. You have to transform your entire energy system. You have to transform your, the way we move around. You have to move away from a culture of the car towards a culture of public transit. It has to be affordable. Maybe it should even be free. Whatever it is, you shouldn't privatize it. That's a very bad idea um, at, a, at a moment like this. And yet, that's precisely what our governments were doing. They were privatizing our energy systems, our rail systems. Some of it's still happening, as you know. Um, and they were handing out the, uh, uh, over these core tools, our airlines, another one, you know, these core 
sectors, fossil fuel driven sectors of the economy. What you have seen so clearly, I think, in Spain is that when you have a privatized energy system, when you have huge for-profit companies dominating your energy market, they're going to see renewable energy as a threat to their core business model. And that's precisely what's happening now with attacks on homeowners that are putting solar panels on their rooftops because they want to become energy producers. Well, your private energy companies see those people as competitors. And this is not something unique to Spain. We're seeing again and again how that profit motive in the energy sector clashes directly with what we need to do in the face of the climate crisis. You know, we've all heard a lot about Germany's energy transition, which ironically Germany, at the same time as it prescribes austerity on the rest of Europe, is doing something very different at home. But, that, but one of the things that has made that energy transition possible is that in hundreds of cities and towns, residents have decided, voted in many cases, in referendums, to take back control over their energy grids um, from the private companies that sold them off which is exactly the opposite of what Germany is demanding of Greece at the moment, that it sell off its energy systems. Um, which is why I think it would be a very good idea for the countries of Southern Europe to begin to say to Germany, we're going to stop doing what you say and we're going to start doing what you do. <laughs> because the other thing that Germany shows is that this is a fantastic way to stimulate your economy and create jobs. Germany has created 400,000 jobs in its energy transition. It has also shown the huge potential of what is increasingly being called energy democracy. Because uh, of the way it's, the, the energy transition was designed, there has been an explosion of uh, participatory ownership in the energy grid. 900 new energy cooperatives, um, as well as this increased uh, what, uh, ownership at the local level of the energy grid which is a way of fighting austerity. When you keep the profits from the power you generate, you can use those profits to pay for services. So you have um, a real win-win. Obviously, the other way in which the logic of neoliberalism clashes with uh, what we need to do in the face of climate change is that it fell out of fashion at precisely this wrong moment. Um, to regulate corporations, which is something that we very much need to do in the face of the climate crisis. We need to tell companies what they can and cannot do. We need to put firm caps uh, on emissions. Um, and we need to say no to companies when they want to drill for oil in new territories. We need to keep the latest science shows um, uh, 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 about three quarters of the known carbon reserves in the ground. Um, and that's where Germany is interesting because despite the fact that they have this amazing energy transition, the Merkel government has been unwilling to say no to the coal companies. So their emissions are not going down nearly as quickly as they should be. In fact, they went up for a couple of years in a row. Uh, and the, and uh, so there's only so far that Germany is willing to bend the rules of, of neoliberalism even at home. But this is one of the clear clashes that we have. We need to regulate corporations. We need to intervene massively in the market. We need to gain public and communal control over many parts of our economies that have been privatized. The other conflict that we're increasingly seeing is with the free trade deals. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, that lock in uh, many of these policies and make it really hard to change direction. So I'll give you an example, and I think this is very re relevant right now because of the battles going on over new trade deals like the TTIP. What we're seeing more and more is that these deals that contain um, investor protection clauses that allow private companies to sue national governments is that when um, you have real popular victories against an extractive practice like fracking, for instance, or against a pipeline carrying a particularly dirty form of oil, as we've been you know, having a big fight in North America over tar sands pipelines, these victories become vulnerable to trade challenges. So for instance, and this is relevant to the fracking fights here in Spain, 
in my country, uh, the province of Quebec successfully banned fracking, but it's now facing an investor challenge under NAFTA, under the North American Free Trade Agreement, from a private company who says it has the right to frack for gas in Quebec. So this is the absolute worst time to be entering into these agreements um, under which trade literally trumps the planet. It's insane, we can't let it happen. There are many, many examples, but I'm sort of running out of time here. Um, I went to, uh, to Frankfurt for the Blockupy protests uh, last week. And you know, I, I went there uh, knowing that I would probably be the only speaker who even mentioned climate change. Um, and I was, <laughs> pretty much, um, for understandable reasons. But you know, what, the reason why I went is because it seems to me that when you look at these, these conflicts between the logic of austerity and what we need to do in the face of climate change, it's time for a merger, a friendly merger between the anti-austerity forces um, and the climate justice movement. Um, for, it's ridiculous that these are two separate conversations that barely speak to each other, that you can have strikes against rail privatization, um, against fare increases for public transit, uh, against energy privatization, and barely mention climate change or not mention it at all. This is the same conversation, and as I said earlier, it only serves our elites when we buy into the logic that climate change is some kind of a luxury. Um, As I said earlier, it's not only a, a conflict with neoliberalism that we face. Because we've waited so long and we now need to respond uh, so rapidly and cut so deeply, we're now facing a, a conflict between that core logic of pursuing growth above all else uh, and staying within planetary limits. But I actually think it's even, de and even deeper than that conflict, which is that you know, I, I think climate change deserves to be seen less as an issue uh, like you know, lots of other issues that we are all thinking about and dealing with, and more as a spiritual crisis, as a civilizational crisis of narrative, of story. Um, because the story of fossil fuels, the story of the industrial use of carbon, is the story of human beings telling themselves that they can dominate, that we can dominate the natural world, that we can liberate ourselves from nature. The story, that story is older than, than the industrial use of fossil fuels. Uh, it dates back to the 1500s, really the 1600s, and Francis Bacon. Um, but it was the industrial burning of coal that allowed that theory that we could dominate the natural world to seem to be turned into a reality. That was, that was the promise of coal, that you no longer needed to think about where you lived. Everywhere could be like everywhere else. The promise um, for, for uh, um, factory owners was that they no longer had to build their factories by rushing water um, to power their factories. They now could build their factories wherever they wanted. They were in charge. Um, and uh, the, the promise for, uh, sh for shipbuilders um, and the owners of fleets of ship was, was that you no longer had to think about when the wind blew. You were no longer at the mercy of the wind. You were once again in charge. And for a long time, fossil fuels really did deliver on this fantasy of freedom from nature, on this fantasy that we are somehow other than this thing we call the environment, as if it is apart from us, as if we are not the environment. Um, climate change is the answer <laughs> that comes at a 200-year delay, <laughs> because all the while that we have been burning coal, at an industrial scale. The carbon has been accumulating in the atmosphere, and it turns out that we were never free. It turns out that we were never in charge. It turns out that we were never having a one-way conversation <laughs> with nature. Now comes the response. And so 
I think that we should not be afraid to see climate change as a message that is being spoken in the language of fires and floods, storms and droughts, telling us that we need a whole new economic model, one based on justice and sustainability. Now, I get this question quite a lot um, about whether or not this is realistic. You know, what, is it possible to change the system so quickly? Is it possible um, to, to have change at this level? And, and I particularly hear from my friends in the environmental movement, you know, like, they take me aside and they say, you know, climate change was big enough. Did you have to make it about capitalism? Um, and the truth is that if everything was wonderful with capitalism, I would say they're absolutely right. You know, if the only problem with this economic system is that it was slowly causing sea levels to rise, I would say there's absolutely no hope that we could change it um, just because of that. It seems too far off and too abstract. But the reality is, is that we are talking about allowing sea levels to rise and endanger life on Earth in myriad other ways in order to protect an economic system that is failing the vast majority of people on this planet with or without climate change. And it is precisely that deep desire for change that you see expressed so powerfully in this country that is what gives me the most hope. What gives me the most hope is the possibility of a convergence between the forces that are already fighting this economic system and the existential urgency of the climate crisis. It puts us on a firm and unyielding science-based deadline. Now, I'm a writer, and I believe that deadlines can be effective. I mentioned that it took me five years to write this book, but I wrote 80% of it in the six months before before it was due. So I think if we can stop looking away from this crisis, get out of our own climate denial, the possibilities for merging these movements are enormous. Um, Spain is living through a historic period, as you well know. Um, the climate movement is living through a historic period. Um, we are seeing victories we never thought imaginable. This, on the streets of New York this September, 400,000 people marched demanding action on climate change. That's four times bigger than the largest climate march before it. Um, we've seen victories against fracking at the national level, at provincial and state levels. Since my book came out, we've seen fracking banned in New York State. We've seen it banned in Wales. We've seen it banned in Scotland. We've seen the very rapid spread of the fossil fuel divestment movement in hundreds of universities and cities and religious institutions demanding the divestment of, of holdings of stocks in fossil fuels, um, coal, oil, gas, because these are now seen as immoral investments. We're hearing the Pope talk about climate change as a moral crisis uh, for humanity. And at the same time, we are seeing um, a very powerful new wa wave of anti-austerity action. Not only activism, um, but as we know, the election of Syriza in Greece, the rise of Podemos in Spain, which is inspiring much of the rest of Europe. The fact that the next big climate conference is happening in Europe, in Paris, at the end of this year, I think is, should be seen as um, an invitation uh, to bring all of these movements together and articulate what a just transition away from fossil fuels looks like. It looks like an economy powered by 100% renewable energy. It looks like energy democracy, power owned by communities with the resources staying in those communities. It looks like good, well-paying jobs um, in the millions. It also looks like recognizing a climate job as something that isn't just putting up solar panels. It is recognizing the caregiving professions that are already low carbon, teaching, nursing, all kinds of caring professions, the arts, 
precisely the parts of our economies that we are starving in this moment. We have an opportunity for a tremendously inspiring transformation if we are just willing to stop looking away. You have new political parties and formations born out of the struggle against austerity, born out of the struggle against eviction from housing. But this vicious system does more than evict individual families from their home. It also is threatening to evict large parts of humanity from our collective home as a result of climate change. This is not apocalyptic rhetoric, it's reality. We need a movement that gets at the logic behind both of these forms of eviction and takes on that logic at its very core. Thank you.